Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer, board, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another drive through RPG review, my written and a video review series. Take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at drivethroughrpg.com. With this video, I'll be reviewing the mega dungeon adventure, Fate's Clouded Gaze, designed by Grim Press for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my content, consider using my affiliate links for your online shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. Fate's Clouded Gaze is a dungeon adventure designed for third level, which, by the way, I don't think it actually says anywhere in the adventure book what level it's for. <laughs> I had to look at the actual uh, store listing on Drive RPG to see that it is uh, designed for third level, then you reach fourth level about halfway through. So pro tip, maybe include uh, the level range for your adventure somewhere in your adventure. Now, I am somebody who loves dungeon crawls, and if you play D&D, you probably enjoy uh, at least the occasional dungeon crawl. I've always been a big fan, and the system is built for it. That's, that's where D&D as a rule system works best, is in the dungeon crawl. Uh, so Fate's Clouded Gaze is nothing but a dungeon crawl. Literally, the entire introduction, which you're seeing here on this first page, is the extent <laughs> of the lead-up into the adventure, which takes place entirely within a single dungeon. Now, the good news is that dungeon that it takes place in is humongous. It is five levels, and each level is about 20 rooms or areas. Uh, by my math, that's about 100 different rooms, and we do a break down room by room of every single area. So we're getting close to like the Tomb of the Nine Gods territory with sheer just magnitude and size of this dungeon, which is exciting and cool. Unfortunately, I have some mixed feelings overall. Uh, I mean, it's hard to compare to the Tomb of the Nine Gods because that's such a cool dungeon and has a lot of neat things happening. This one, I think the designer does a cool job of putting together some interesting puzzles and the exploration pillar of D&D, which is, uh, you know, letting your players explore the space and getting into secret doors and looking at murals and solving puzzles and doing all that kind of cool stuff. In fact, for a five-level dungeon, it is shocking, shockingly low on combat, which is pretty surprising. I, I even was like, man, give me an occasional, like, goblin nest or something here. The Where it falls apart in what I'm getting into is the story. There, there's really not much story story here and then when you get in the dungeon it it tries to do a few things but ultimately i think it really falls flat to where by the end of it there's you just don't really care about like you know the nameless threat villain or anything going on so even from a you know and from a russian like action rpg stand because not every you know doesn't have to be this big story heavy thing you can just go in there and kill shit and get loot but this one is so long and has such a big exploration aspect to it that it needed it needs something to back that up because it 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 tries to tell something going on here, but there's no good notes on like NPC interactions. Uh, in fact, the layout in general, it it's it's got descriptions for every room, which is really nice. And in fact, shockingly impressive that we get these little sidebar like read aloud descriptions for every single one of these. Again, 100 rooms for five areas. That's amazing. But that's all it is is these room by room breakdowns. There's no like sidebars. There's no dramatis personae that has all the information for NPCs. In fact, there are uh, parts where um, like certain stat blocks are not bolded and treasure is not bolded. So it gets really hard to actually to parse this and read through it and figure out all the important information. So I had um, kind of a problem getting through all that. As you can see, we do get full color battle maps, which is awesome. And I'm a, that's a huge thumbs up, always a thumbs up for me. And if your adventure is based entirely around a single dungeon crawl, then having maps is, I would think, a requirement. Uh, but having a map art style that I like is not necessarily a requirement, but I do like this art style. It's very good. In fact, we get DM versions, which you're seeing here embedded. I, I wish the uh, the designer had went ahead and put these, had blown these up and had them go ahead and take up half the page. I get that they're, you know, landscape mode. Just flip them on their side if you need to. Do whatever you need because it all the art is kind of small in here and it makes it even harder to get through all the blocks of text. Uh, but you get these GM versions. You also get uh, gridded and non-player gridded without all the annotations on there. So you can use those for your virtual tabletops or to print out or whatever. The The story here, from what I can tell, is there's some 
it got a super generic. There's just some deep uh, void monster that has that was arose from a thin, you know, in, in veil between worlds, and long ago heroes pushed it back, but weren't able to fully defeat it. You know, stop me if you've heard this before. And the evil is of course lurking there, ready to escape pretty soon. Now flip ahead to modern time, whatever Andy is, and you've got the uh, this group called the Foretellers, which is a kind of a doomsday cult, I guess, has set up shop in near this town of Huxley, uh, near the temple, I guess. And there's an interesting twist here, and I can appreciate that it's at least not where you think it's going, where they're just all like worshiping and they've been corrupted by this evil. In fact, the Foretellers are from what I can tell, not necessarily the bad guys. They are like just a legit doomsday cult. Um, they still are uh, tyrannically under the rule of a prophet character. So they're not necessarily like, a, they're not the good guys, but they're also not the like corrupted evil villains that you would be expecting. So what I like about this dungeon is you're not just kicking down the doors and fighting your way room to room every single level. In fact, the first level you can walk in and be like, hey, we just want to sign up for a reading from the prophet, you know, hail, hey, foretell, all that, whatever. And you can kind of do it like a social with a little bit of maybe scooting off an role playing thing And I, as you delve deeper into the dungeon. So that's a cool twist. I enjoy that. I enjoy the hell out of that. Then we get to uh, like level two and now you're probably not supposed to be there anymore and maybe, but there's still, you know, some cultists there or the foretellers are there so you can deal with them a little bit. And then as you dive deeper, by the time you get to level three, now you've got the last of the guards are there and they're saying, hey, there's monsters around here. We're trying to keep them at bay. We know there's evil coming. That's what our prophecies, you know, that, it's basically why they're a doomsday. You know, they're prepping for this great evil that's coming through. Uh, and you can, and it gets kind of creepy when you get to the third level. You can see like battle scenes from where it killed some of these foretellers, and you know there's some undead threats lurking around. the The best thing that this adventure does is, I I think it's in the exploration stuff, and I mentioned that earlier. But it really does a cool job of putting some interesting traps and puzzles. There's doors that you know one door closes, one door opens. There's one cool bit where if you open both of these doors that go into different areas, that's what triggers this sarcophagus in the middle that unleashes this frozen void cultist who actually tries to befriend the party and says that they are one of the great heroes that once tried to stop this creature. But of course, he's actually uh, one of the cultists of the void monster. And so he tries to lead the play, which I, I love that. That's a good little, you know, a, a great way to, to check that uh, social RP scene on there. But for moments like that, I wish there were more to it. Like, give me more for this character. Like, how do I role play them? What do they look like? What are their mannerisms? I don't need an entire big, you know, long thing on it. I'm not necessarily asking for that, but you at least need to give me like a few sentences, maybe a paragraph if they're an important NPC of information. And I really felt that lacking uh, throughout this adventure, which was pretty disappointing. But the trap part of it, the secret doors, um, there's a there's a part where you're like moving these rings around that, uh, you know, and the different words and the different words will trigger different, you know, doors or traps or things and you'll find that information. Uh, where is that? Yeah, like right here on uh, the priest bedroom on, on level on the second level, but and then you'll find how to, you know, unlock certain things in different areas. That's really, really good. And it's it I, I think it's very rewarding for players to be able to learn all that stuff and they learn some things, they don't learn others. And it, there's multiple entrances for at least the first two levels. And then once you get to the other levels, it gets a little trickier and more uh, linear, but there's still like opening branching paths, which I appreciate. Um, one thing that works for having multiple levels in a mega dungeon, however, is that like the biome changes somehow. Obviously Dungeon of the Mad Mage did this very well, where it was like entirely different, you know, dungeon almost every level. Uh, Two of the Nine Gods at least had different themes of different dungeons. It was like this one's this level's ruled by the Beholder, or this level's got these gears that change or something. This dungeon, unfortunately, doesn't really do anything like that. So I, I kept expecting things to get really crazy by the time you get to the bottom, because it's this whole void, you know, uh, creature, this unspeakable horror, which is, you know, it's tricky to do that as a villain because you lose the personality of the villain, and sure enough, you just don't care by the time the villain you know, you get to that last villain room. Unfortunately, the, the this Temple Mega Dungeon never really gets to that point. It never really changes. It's just, you're kind of going through the same dungeon. Obviously, the things change, and uh, the fact that it gets more dangerous, so I do like the fact that it starts off as, 
you know, maybe a more social RP thing as you deal with the foretellers and you get deeper and, and realize things are, you know, more scary and, and untouched. And I especially like that the, the foretellers even only made it about halfway through the dungeon. So when you start making it deeper than that, then you start, you know, getting to the real monsters and threats. But it never really changes. It gets crazier. You can see even by the map art, it's just kind of the same biome the whole time and never really, to me, it never really reflects this interesting void theme that we're going for. It never goes like full into madness or anything. The one interesting thematic tool it does, which I do like, is it uses a void template for uh, its creatures. So all the creatures have been touched by the void, by this thin veil and by the void monster. I think it's literally called like a void, yeah, void monster. <laughs> it's even a generic freaking name. Um, but I like that it, it, instead of coming up with a bunch of new stat blocks necessarily, instead it uses existing stat blocks and just says, hey, just apply these different uh, creature things to it. They gain this void breath, they gain extra necrotic damage, they gain certain immunity. So, you know, to reflect the fact that they all have this different uh, aspect that's been uh, just af affecting them this whole time, which, you know, could be like a swarm of giant rats or it could be uh, just a, a cultist or a person you come across all have this kind of voidness to them. So that part's pretty cool. And I thought a clever way of, of uh, subverting a lot of expectations because it's hard to to separate, especially uh, veteran players from metagaming a little too much when they see certain monsters or threats. They're like, okay, you kind of know they're very, you know, power level. Uh, but this lets you kind of change that if they're that glowing with this energy. You're like, oh no, what are they going to be capable of? And it turns out they're a much different stat block. So there's a lot to like about this adventure. I mean, I, I think there are some cool things. I like that it does. Uh, I think the exploration aspect is very well done. Um, I think the, the, the map art for the actual dungeon is is cool. Um, all the different, like I said, puzzles and traps and things. Monsters, I would maybe expect a little bit more from the monsters a little bit. There's, I mean, the first two levels have hardly anything. Um, I think there's like a mummy that's trapped in there that's like giving the prophet his powers, which is kind of cool. Uh, otherwise, it's a lot of undead that are just kind of hanging out or there's a, there's a neat a uh, bit um, where you're going through a bunch of crypts and there's a lot of undead in all of them, but the undead are of course preserved all their, well, like a lot of their equipment is not. So there's like these a pair of skeletons that try to shoot you with their crossbows and their crossbows just explode and kill the skeletons. That was actually pretty interesting because usually you don't see designers creating a monster situation where the monsters purposely uh, like debuff or make their make it harder for the DM to run the encounter from a balanced perspective. Usually it's the opposite end where like something you've done makes the monster stronger or makes the players weaker or there's some kind of hazard or something. So that was a fun little bit that obviously that's not the case for all the situations, but allows a little bit of a twist there. And there's just a lot of neat things. There's a, there's a part where there's a, a, a door that uh, there's a, a statue that breathes fire on you. And it's pretty obvious when you see all the, like their scorch marks and there's a statue with its eyes. I mean, I mean, statues are always a red flag in D and D Dunder crawls, right? And this one's no different. Uh, but in order to open the door, you have to open it with a, with a charred hand. So you have to actually be burnt from the statue. So you have to allow the somebody to actually burn themselves or come up with some clever way of, of having some burned flesh or something. There's a bit towards the end of, I think it's the third or fourth level where uh, you have to straight up sacrifice somebody. Now you could use an NPC or a PC, but the twist is that they will immediately be resurrected. You just have to be able to go through with that, which could be a big emotional thing. Um, and then once they're like incinerated or whatever, then they immediately get resurrected and then the, the door unlocks. <laughs> so that's a nice uh, little bit of a twist, I think. So very, very cool ideas in here. Even if you're not necessarily gonna run the strict dungeon crawl, just having access to these maps and having like 40 pages worth of room ideas throughout here uh, is is actually very, very valuable and makes, you know, Dungeon Crawl Adventures, I think that much more valuable because you can use a lot of that content in piecemeal. Uh, I just think as an overall story, it just doesn't do anything with the story. And, and by the end, I mean, I don't think there's any epilogue section whatsoever. Um, it's just, yeah, that's like a two paragraphs. I mean, the void monster even talks to you like it's a, like a mustache twirling villain, which is odd. Like why would this eldritch threat, like even you are not powerful enough to defeat me. Like, <laughs> it just seems so goofy. This tentacle threat is just talking like a, like a hammy super villain. So I don't know. I, I did not get a good uh, vibe on this, on this bare bone story whatsoever. But I think a lot of the content is actually uh, pretty interesting. All right, let's go over my pros and cons for Fate's Clouded Gaze Pro, a mega dungeon that features five levels with over 100 areas. The quantity is definitely there. This is probably 
gosh, one of the biggest single dungeons I've ever reviewed from a third party source, I think, which is pretty huge because I've been doing this for years. Uh, that is a gigantic dungeon crawl that actually does do a room by room by room by room by room breakdown. And as another pro to lead into this one, every room kind of has something interesting. There's really no dead spaces where it's like you walk in and like this room is empty or something. Like even an empty room will still have descriptions on it. It will still have, you know, something about the lighting or maybe some kind of clue. It just, it, it, a really interesting way of, of just densely packing so much interesting content into every single room and it does it because I've made this complaint about other adventures it doesn't mean throwing monsters in every single room and in fact I mentioned this before this one's actually surprisingly light on combat considering the size of its dungeon I, I was kind of shocked in fact it, it's mostly exploration based but in, in a cool way like there's a lot of like secret traps and and you know doors and puzzles and things to, to figure out and there there is some monsters to attack but uh, I think it does the exploration part really well, and it's because it jam-packs so much into every single room. There's still, like I said, some rooms that you can just, hey, this is a safe place where you can rest, but it, there's a description in every single room, which is amazing. So that kind of content and that attention to detail is phenomenal. Pro full color maps for each dungeon level, including a GM version and then two player versions with the gridded and non-gridded version, which is everything I could ask for when it comes to map art. Super thumbs up to that. Uh, and pro of the void traits. I think that was a cool way of making, uh, of, of reflecting the theme of the dungeon and was probably the best attempt at creating an interesting, like immersive feel and, and story based thing is by using these void traits for the, in a mechanical way, is using those void traits for the monsters. I thought that was an interesting twist. Uh, maybe it probably could have done with a few more unique, cool monsters rather than just that boss fight at the end. But uh, I, honestly, there's enough there that I think could be uh, an easy way of modifying monsters. And I, you don't see that often enough, I think. A lot of people either use existing monsters or uh, simply create their own. But I, modifying, modifying existing monsters with different kind of traits to turn them into maybe something else or some kind of thing affecting them is, is a cool idea. So cons... I think I have to ding it for a bare bone story. There's just nothing interesting going on from a story standpoint. It's extremely almost like, I don't want to say like AI generated Lord, but um, just very generic. It's just too generic for anything interesting going on here. Um, another con that I'm going to call out is a lack of NPC notes or sidebars or information or something to do with the important NPCs. It's not obviously a story heavy adventure, so I'm not gonna expect necessarily an entire Dramatis Personae, but anytime you mention an important person that should be interacting with the party socially, for example, maybe the prophet, um, there's uh, like a pair of cultists who are kind of stashing things and maybe looking for a way to escape the, the foreteller, so those maybe would be worth uh, pointing out. Um, and then there's two, I think maybe even three characters they can gain that are all like uh, people who are awakened from the void. Two of them are surprise villains, and the third one is actually one of the legit heroes um, that could have all used a little more information in NPC notes because it's just important if your players are desperate for that, and especially with you know this one being very RP light, uh, especially when you get to the second half, it, give me those kind of notes so I know how to run those uh, characters and maybe what their you know motivations are. I don't, again, expect a whole page on them, but at least some information. And then the other con I'm also going to call out is I think the entire layout is a little too densely packed. And I'm not complaining about the fact that we got information uh, for every room. That's awesome. But I think literally just the layout, trying to read through this, is, is really challenging. I don't know if we needed like some full page artwork or if the maps need to be blown up. Sidebars I think would have helped a lot, but something that breaks up the just constant room by room by room by room by room by room by room thing is a little too much. It's not a big deal if you've got maybe a 10 room dungeon or something where it's like, okay, here's your stuff and then we move on to the other thing. But this is the entire adventure. The entire adventure is a room by room breakdown and it gets kind of exhausting and intimidating to actually read through everything that's going on. So something, all those I mentioned would have been nice to be able to break all that up. Final verdict, though it fails to tell a compelling story, the sheer magnitude of the five level densely packed mega dungeon is impressive and it's full of cool ideas and interesting puzzles. <laughs> Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewanson.com. You can watch more reviews and follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel and support my work at patreon.com slash 
Rogue Watson. Shouts to a Platinum Patrons, Joe, Will, Thomas, Stan, Brandon, Jenna Center, David, Eclectic, Role Player, Role, Christopher, Brian, William, Corey, Coa, 1337, Big Nut, John, John, Chris, Scott, Gene, Eric, Dan, Tyler, Nathan, Camp, Crystal Light, Counselor, Big Ship, Andrew, Daryl, The Reldron, and Matt, and Gold Patrons, RPG, Paper Crafts, Pretty Boy, and Yuma, Marcus, Dead Lizard, Lion, Sam, Lumpy's Buds, Drome, Nathan, Fast Second, Tortoise, Scott, Rufus, Carolina, and William. Thank you all very much for your support.